boosting the net immigration of young adults to our population aging gradually, many, including the Premier, are concerned about the future. How scary are our demographics and what steps should we take to address the issue? And is it a cause for worry? Join us as we take you through the journey of the scary truth about population demography. Scary demographic. Let's take a close look at a state in Canada called Newfoundland, which had a peak population in 1992, the year the code moratorium was announced, at 580,000. After that, it fell to a low of 506,000 in 2006, and it is now expanding gradually, at a pace of roughly 1,000 each year. The primary cause of this population drop was young adults moving to Canada's mainland. As a result, there aren't enough people in the age range of 25 to 40. These demographics, along with the baby boom bulge of individuals in their 45s and 60s, are probably going to produce some economic upheaval in the ensuing decades. I've shown working age individuals, 20 to 65, as a percentage of the population, based on two population predictions to help you understand the issue. However, the percentage of the population that is working age currently stands at over 63%, and in 20 years, this is expected to fall to just over 50%. Surprisingly, because the high growth scenario predicts a higher birth rate and infants take a while to enter the workforce, the decline is more severe. Speaking of the unsettling realities of population demography, we shall examine the frightening demography of Japan in addition to the many countries that suffer from it. Scary demographics in Japan. For a long time, Japanese people have considered the worrying demographics of this aging country to be a problem of the future rather than the present. However, a prime minister who claims that a crisis demanding immediate sacrifices has already begun is challenging that way of thinking. Yoshihiko Noda, then prime minister, gambled his career and his position on a tax hike intended to pay for Japan's skyrocketing social security expenses. Furthermore, the proposed tax increase is but a taste of the hardships to follow as Japan develops into the greyest society in the world, a country where, in just 20 years, the number of seniors will nearly quadruple that of children aged 15 and under. To care for its elderly, economists, and government officials predict that Japan will likely raise taxes once again, raise the retirement age, and reduce spending on everything from defense to education in the upcoming years. The majority of the cost will fall on young Japanese people who are starting their careers amid two decades of stagnation. They will earn less than their parents did in real terms, pay more towards their pensions, have access to fewer social services, and eventually receive a smaller pension when they retire. Let's take a closer look at this one now. First off, Japan's economy is far from reaching its full potential by any means. Why in the world are tax increases necessary to cover any expenses at this point? This doesn't make any sense. But you know what would make sense? It's you banging the subscribe button. Please subscribe to our channel for more updates. Don't forget to like, share, and comment on this video. Now let's continue. All Japan has to do is carry on with its current course of running huge deficits, financed by the purchase of government bonds by its central bank. Deflation has been a problem in Japan for most of the past 20 years. The 10-year government bond interest rate was close to 1%. If the then Prime Minister Noda claimed that tax increases are necessary, he either has a basic understanding of economics or had a secret objective. It is very clear that raising taxes is not necessary, given the state of the economy. Through decreased demand and employment, a tax rise would be detrimental to the economy. Let's look at the bigger picture. Over the past 20 years, Japan's production has grown at a rate of 1.8% annually. Production per worker will be 150% higher in 2050 than it was in 2000 if this trend persists. In 2050, the after-social security tax wage will be approximately 80% higher than it is today if the ratio of workers to retirees decreases from approximately 3 to 1 to approximately 1 to 1. And if Japan's pension system gives its workers a pension equal to 50% of the average worker's income with social security benefits accounting for 40% of the average wage. Upon closer inspection, this most likely underestimates the potential gains. However, productivity growth is probably going to pick up speed as the labor force gets smaller. Two things would lead to this. First, by leaving open the least productive positions, such as the midnight shift at 7, 11, average production will rise. Finally, the anxiety over reducing education funding may diminish when we consider that Japan is experiencing a dramatic decline in the number of children living there. Why wouldn't Japan reduce its educational expenditures? Simply put, this means that the lower taxes required to sustain a smaller population of children 
will somewhat offset the tax increases required to fund a greater number of retirees. To put it briefly, there isn't a convincing argument for why future Japanese generations will be poorer than the present one due to population decline. This outcome could, of course, be the consequence of poor economic management. Now, while the consequences of poor economic management are certainly important, today's video has a different focus. However, if you're eager to dive into that topic, let's make it happen. Simply type poor economy in the comments, and if we reach 15 comments, we'll promptly produce the video. Your satisfaction is our priority, and we thrive on creating content that resonates with you. We're happiest when you're happy with what we bring to the table. Now let's continue our ride, as we are almost reached the promised land. Infants are not the solution. You need children if you want to have a nation. Increasing the birth rate, possibly by raising the baby bonus, is one realistic way to combat our aging population demographic. But there are several problems with such a policy. For example, any new policy now to increase the birth rate generally won't have a major impact on the labor pool until around 2035, by which the majority of boomers will have been retired for several years, as people typically don't enter the workforce until they are adults. It would be too little, too late to increase birth rates now. This strategy also has an underlying issue that is unconnected to the baby boom. As things are going, Canada's life expectancy will be roughly 85 years by 2031. Working age individuals would make up 53% of the population if population distribution were consistent throughout all age groups up to 85. However, raising the birth rate will only rebalance the burden of care from elderly to childbearing without reducing the ratio of working to non-working people because children take the same amount of time to enter the workforce 20 years from age 0 to 20 as retirees do 65 to 85 years. Furthermore, even though we have up until now treated children and retirees equally, the two groups are quite different financially. Retirement benefits the economy in a variety of ways. Wealthy retirees are a source of investment capital and philanthropy, while others volunteer with charities and community groups, provide childcare and receive federal and private pensions that support economic demand and local taxes. From an economic standpoint, however, Children are essentially to be counted in this case, since they lack money, jobs, and skills. Please forgive children when I said children are not to count. I mean no disrespect to you guys. What I mean is that you guys are more of an expenditure because everything is provided to you. In addition, they receive years of public schooling at a cost that is comparable to that of senior healthcare. In actuality, children are not a cheap labor source in modern economies. Rather, they constitute an expensive and long-term investment. The average number of children a woman will have in her lifetime is known as her fertility rate, and this fact explains why fertility rates are low in developed nations and dropping in the majority of emerging nations. The secret to winning the demographic game. Increasing the net immigration of young individuals is the most practical way to buck the demographic curve. This entails pushing for both the migration of other young people and the retention of youth. Although interprovincial movement makes up the majority of migration, foreign immigration is increasingly contributing to the demographic increase. For example, according to Canada Statistics Investigation, the employment market and the personal traits of migrants, who are primarily young individuals looking for good jobs, explain a major portion of the interprovincial mobility trends of English-speaking Canadians. According to the study, a 1% reduction in the unemployment rate would result in a greater than 10% drop in the outmigration rate. Reducing the unemployment rate to the Canadian average would result in an annual net increase in interprovincial mobility of almost 5,000 individuals, or the equivalent of all NL births annually, if the effect on in-migration is even half as great as this. Population growth will take care of itself if we find a solution to the unemployment issue. The number of foreign immigrants has increased dramatically, reaching roughly 1,000, and there is great room for growth. Take Manitoba as an example. Solving the issue, instead of increasing the birth rate, we should concentrate on luring and keeping young people in order to address our demographic problems. I don't think early childhood education makes sense as a population growth plan, even though I believe there is solid evidence that it is a wise investment for long-term economic development. To offset dropping birth rates, we should instead concentrate on increasing employment prospects for youth and luring and keeping talented immigrants. What do you think about the population growth? Let us know in the comment section below. Do you know what else is scary? Check out our previous videos on the channel. China's plan to conquer six countries at once. See you in our next video.